been wonderful to be with you, but it's been better to be in God's presence. And we have been there, and no doubt, well, we know we're already there now. hope you're aware of that. It's an awful thing, you know. It's an awful thing to be unconscious of God's presence. It's a terrible thing. Uh, Let's read together. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. If you don't have a copy of the Scriptures, just listen as we read together, or maybe some kind person beside you will uh, allow you to share their copy of Scripture. Luke chapter 2, and I'm speaking tonight on losing the presence of Christ or missing the presence of Christ. We've been welcoming God's presence these nights, and on Thursday evening we started looking at the history of his presence in Scripture, and then we looked on Friday night at his presence presently, the way we experience God's presence now. Last night, I gave you some practical biblical guidelines how to practice the presence of God every day in your lives. And this morning, uh, we were looking at the preparation for his presence. But tonight, we're looking at missing or losing his presence. Verse 40, then, of Luke 2. And the child, that is Jesus, grew... And became strong in the spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, Why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Let's pray together. Each night I've been getting you to pray. And tonight's no exception. I I want you just now to pray for yourself. Would you do that? That God would speak to you. I don't know why you're here. Some of you might be here because your arm's been twisted up your back, and I know how it works. And you've been emotionally blackmailed to get here. At least that's the way you feel. And you would love to be somewhere else, all places, stuck in church tonight on a beautiful evening. But listen, I believe if just now you would turn to God and pray, I don't know how long it is since you've prayed, but if you would just say, Lord, speak to me, I believe he will. He'll speak to you. He'll speak right into your life, into your personal experience. Now, we're not to test the Lord, but you should prove this, really. I mean, would you like to hear from God? Would you like to hear from heaven? Well, then, ask him. It's not rocket science. Ask him, and he'll speak to you. You may not even be a Christian. You may be a struggling Christian. You may be a, a Christian who really, at this moment, needs to hear from God. So would you do that? Just before I preach, would you just say, it can be as simple as, Lord, please speak to me. It could even be as wishy-washy as, Lord, if you're even there. Maybe that's where you are right now. If you're even there, speak to me. Okay? Because he wants to speak to you. But he wants to be welcomed. So let's come. Father, we bless your name tonight. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the fact that he came and manifested your presence to us in human form. We thank you for his life and we thank you for his death where he paid the penalty for our sins. We thank you he was buried in the third day, he rose again. And now through the Holy Spirit we can know him personally indwelling us and walking with us through this life. But Lord, there are people in this gathering just now, and they're missing out on his presence. And Lord, there's even Christians 
and they've lost a sense of his presence. And Lord, we thank you for your presence now with us in this place. But Lord, we, we, we long that there would be no one completely oblivious, blind, deaf, and dumb to the presence of Almighty God in this sanctuary. And more importantly, in their lives. So come, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Heavenly Father. We pray that all other presences will be pushed out of the building tonight and we will be completely overwhelmed and overtaken by your presence, O our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, all children are very precious. And of course, our own children are the most precious of all. There's none like your own. And apart from them being your own flesh and blood, you recognize so many special, unique characteristics and traits in your own children, lovable traits. Imagine what that would have been like for Mary and Joseph, eh? with Jesus. How they observed the development of the boy Jesus. Look at verse 40, it gives a little bit of a glimpse. The child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. What special memories we all have of birth, childhood, and the development of kids. But what sacred memories. Imagine it that Joseph and Mary would have had. I'm not going to go over the whole Christmas story, but remember the angel's salutation to this young girl, Mary, pronouncing to her that she was conceiving of the Holy Spirit and the one that was in her womb would be the Messiah of God, the Savior of the world. And you remember the dreams that Joseph had? You know, he, he was so confused. He, he thought Mary had been unfaithful to him. And God had to come to him and reveal in a revelatory, supernatural way that that was not the case. And you remember how the two of them eventually come and that uh, no room in the inn incident in Bethlehem that we're so familiar with? What would that have been like? And then having to give birth in the stable, wrapping that little babe in swaddling bands and laying him in a feeding trough. Think of it. The bread of life came down from heaven and is laid in a food container in the house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means. And this is a sign from heaven, as the angel said. There will be a sign. And then what about the, the, the memory recall of the shepherds looking after their sheep? And by the way, those sheep would be needed for sacrifice in Jerusalem, six miles away. And their job was to make sure that these lambs would be delivered, that would be eventually slaughtered for the sins of the people. And here these shepherds were to welcome into the world the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the entire humanity. Is it any wonder that here in verse 19 of chapter 2, it says, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in our heart. What memories of the boy Jesus. And then it came to the, the moment of presenting Jesus in the temple. And the old man that's there, he's almost ready to die. And he astonishes Mary and Joseph when he says, you can see it in this chapter, verse 29, Now, Lord, you're letting your servant depart in peace. I can go and die now. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And then you add to this the uh, testimony of Anna, an old godly woman in the temple, She'd been fasting and praying all her life. She testifies to the identity of Jesus. And then there's the wise men in, in Matthew chapter 2, and you know all about that. They say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And they came to the house where, where, where the boy was, and they brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And this is all in the scrapbook, the photograph album, so to speak, of Mary and Joseph. So you can imagine the horror that gripped their heart when the angel told Joseph in a dream in Matthew 2, verse 13, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be there until you have word, for Herod will seek to destroy the young child. 
Now think about this for a moment. The horror that must have gripped them, having experienced all they had supernaturally and observing the development of this special child, and now the prospect comes to them of losing this one. Must have terrified them. Herod would rob them of Jesus, the gift of God. And even when they did return from Egypt to the Holy Land, they feared Herod's son, who was now reigning, Archelaus. So they went to the town of Nazareth. You see, the enemies of God, Herod and his son, were wanting to rob Mary and Joseph of his presence. So then, think of how ironic is this tragic story that we read tonight in Luke chapter 2, that one day Mary and Joseph themselves lost him. Imagine. I mean, we would say, imagine letting a child like that out of your sight. <laughs> we would all know better, especially in a busy place like Jerusalem, at the, the feast of Passover. There's thousands of people teeming in and out of the city, and you let them out of your, your sight. And yet, how many times have we been similarly negligent with the presence of God in our lives, with the presence of Christ in our hearts, and we can condemn Mary and Joseph of gross negligence, dereliction of duty. But how many times? And when you further think that it took them a day, a whole day to realize that they had lost them. That's what the text says. I want to ask you, do you know the presence of God in your life? Or was there a time in your past when you once walked with Him, you, you were abiding in Jesus, and you once knew what that was to live the Spirit-filled life, and you were conscious of His nearness every moment of the day, but through your own neglect or dereliction of duty, I don't know what it is, but you would have to say tonight with William Cooper, where is the blessedness I knew? When first I saw the Lord, where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his love? I want to share with you tonight how easy it is to lose the presence of God. I'm not talking about essentially your salvation, not relationship. That's your union with God in Jesus Christ. But I'm talking about communion. If relationship is like a chain that's hard to break, fellowship is a thread that's very easily broken. And your fellowship with God will be broken by one thing and one thing only, sin. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? And if you want to walk with God, you've got to walk in agreement with Him. And you know what agreement is? It's simply confession. Confession of your need of Him and confession when you do something wrong. Confession is simply putting your hand up and saying, guilty as charged, I'm agreeing with the plumb line of Scripture, what your word says about my life, my lifestyle, my choices, and I'm coming into line with you, turning, that's repentance, turning from my way and turning to your way. That's how you walk with God. And He gives the power to do that. And all the revelation to show us when we're, we're, we're of being. 1 John 1 and verse 5 tells us, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So you can only enjoy fellowship with God if you're walking in the light. But if you're covering over evil, trying to hide it, you cannot enjoy God's fellowship. And it's tragic to think Mary and Joseph guarded the presence of Jesus from the worldly king Herod. They cherished Christ and they even challenged the sinfulness of that king. And yet they lost his presence themselves. And it was only in a moment. He was gone in a moment. And they didn't even realize it. And that's all it takes. It only takes a moment for any of us to be estranged from Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you tonight, is that you? Maybe you're someone who's never known His presence, so you, you don't know what you're missing. But you have detected in this gathering, or maybe with Christians who have brought you here, or you're familiar with, and family, friends, or work colleagues, you know there's something different. There's a presence about them that they carry that is special, and it's something that you don't have, and you want it. But maybe you are someone who once had a real, real strong communion with Jesus, but tonight you've lost your song. 
You've lost your joy. You've lost your power and anointing for service. Maybe you've even lost your testimony because you've burned your bridges, you think, and you've made mistakes and blotted the copybook, and you feel that there's no road back. Maybe you once had an effective prayer life, but you don't even know how to pray any longer, and there's no direction in your life whatsoever. And even if you're not any of those two types of people, if you're a Christian tonight, you need to be careful. Now, I don't want to engender fear in, in any of us, but at the same time, we need to beware, for it only takes one moment, one moment of negligence, apathy, and ignorance for us to lose the presence of Jesus Christ. Maybe you know what the sin is that has robbed you of his presence, you can go right back to that moment now in your mind. Or maybe you're ignorant of it. You don't know why, but once it was there, and now it's no longer there. Or maybe you're in denial. You don't want to admit that things aren't the way they used to be or aren't the way they should be. It's so long since you had his tangible presence in your life that you've got used to be without it. And it says here in this passage that it was a day or two long before they, it was three days before they, they found Jesus and got him back. How long has it been for you? How far have you traveled without Jesus Christ in your life? How easy it is to lose his presence. But I want you to see, secondly, often the most unexpected people lose his presence. It wasn't Simeon that only momentarily had an acquaintance with with Jesus and held him in his arms. Rather, it was the very bosom of the one who had nursed and nurtured him in life, the one who, humanly speaking, had brought him into the world. We might go as far to say it was the ones who loved him the most, and in an earthly sense, the ones whom Jesus loved the most. It was they who lost him. Many of the greatest saints of God in the past have experienced a withdrawal of God's presence. Sometimes it can be called the dark night of the soul where they no longer see Christ or hear His voice to their heart. They no longer feel His touch. And I have to say to you that I've had that experience several times. The most recent was during your 21 days of prayer and fasting. That was an awful period for me spiritually. And it's mysterious. But all I know is that it happens, and it's happened to me a couple of times, and it could happen to you. Why does it happen? Well, one reason it can happen is the chastening of the Lord. It can be a direct result of sin, and I think there probably was sin in my life. But it could also be for our good. As loving parents, do not spare the rod or you'll spoil the child. And God's Word says, whom the Lord loves, He chastens and disciplines every child whom He receives. And at times, God's presence is withdrawn, and we feel forsaken, though we never are. We, we don't always know a parent's smile, but we can always know His love. Isn't that right? And it says of King Hezekiah in the Old Testament, and this comforts me, that God withdrew him withdrew from him that he might test him to see what was in his heart. And we've been enjoying an incredible sense of God's presence these nights. And we don't want to lose it. Sure we don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic. But you can imagine. I mean, I remember one of the nights you were having a half night of prayer here. And it, it was electric. It was incredible. And I was sitting beside Alan at the back there. And I knew God was everywhere. I knew I was in the middle of God's presence, but I couldn't feel a thing. And I came out for prayer that night. Sometimes we need discipline. Sometimes we need God to do this, and it's a mysterious thing. But sin, as I've alluded to, is usually the reason why we lose God's presence. Isaiah 59, verse 2, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. 
Adam, we saw the other night, was made in the image of God, but he disobeyed, and he made a choice. Rather than an intimate fellowship and a relationship with God, he chose self and sin, and he ends up hiding from God behind the trees of the garden. He used to walk in great intimacy with him in the cool of the day, and now he's lost the presence of God. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what position you hold in church or in life. You need to keep short accounts with God. Do you know what that means? You need to deal with sin as soon as you fall. You need to walk in the light as he is in the light. Then we have fellowship one with the other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. But we've got to confess our sins. And then he's faithful and just to forgive us. Often the most expected people lose his presence. Who would have thought Mary and Joseph would have lost the presence of Christ? But I want you to see, thirdly, this can happen in the most unlikely places. You see where it happened? It happened at a feast. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2, we read, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. It's easy to lose God at a wedding. Have you noticed that? At a wedding, people are occupied with superficiality, skin-deep beauty and material frill and fri fr frivolity. And, and all of the celebration is right that we should enjoy it. But it's harder to lose God. It's harder to lose the realities of eternity and our own mortality at a funeral. Isn't that right? I'm always getting in trouble with my wife, things I say in the pulpit. I remember at a wedding saying I would rather go to a funeral any day. That was not the right thing to say. <laughs> At a wedding, but I was talking about this text, how sometimes we can lose God in the midst of it all. And it's true. It's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. And you know something? 20th century, the last one, and this now, 21st century humanity has been and is a feast in the West. We are materialistic gluttons. Things have never been so good pleasure, luxury of the modern age. And what it has done, it's this feasting has robbed us of Christ's presence, even in the church, and His power. And the problem is we've become so intoxicated and anaesthetized that life's realities and eternity's destinies of heaven and hell and the need to be right with God, we're completely oblivious to. This happened at a feast. And I want to say to you young people, here tonight, you might be successful in your life and everything's looking good for you and uh, your horizon is promising, but it could be that Christ isn't on your horizon. And that's why in Ecclesiastes, the wise man said, remember now your creator in the days of your youth, why the evil days do not come nor the years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Don't lose Christ in your face. Let the goodness of God lead you to Repentance not drive you further into pleasure and God-forgetfulness. This can happen in the most unlikely places at a feast, but see also it was in the holy city. This is Jerusalem. This was holy ground. The great congregation of pilgrims at Passover, they were among family and friends, relatives and community. They were celebrating their religious and traditional heritage. But none of that prevented them losing Christ. You can have your church, and you can have your religious persuasion, and you can have maybe grandparents or great-grandparents, a long lineage of believers or good living religious folk in your family, but it doesn't mean that you'll not lose the presence of Christ. <laughs> it could be that these religious signs and activities distract it. Mary and Joseph, it probably did, from knowing that they'd lost Jesus. What? They could be the problem. Please don't mistake familiarity with holy things as intimacy with the Holy One. We've seen how easy it is to lose His presence, and often the most unexpected people lose His presence, and it can happen in the most unlikely places. But I want to finish by saying this to you. His company can be recovered. It says they sought Him. 
But I want to ask you here tonight, I don't care whether you're a believer or not, whether you're born again, a Christian or not, I don't, I don't care those classifications at this moment. I just want to ask you a question. Whatever hue in the spectrum you are, are you presently seeking him? If you're not converted, are you seeking him? If you're backslidden, are you seeking him? If you're a Christian, are you seeking him? Are you seeking more of him? Because there's a promise in the Bible, Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God, but he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I'm, I'm giving you a promise tonight. If you seek God, you'll find him. And if you seek more of him, you'll get more of him. He promises that. But for some of you, well, to recover him, you need to go back to where you lost him. Did you ever lose your car keys, ladies? <laughs> Very sexist, I know, but it is true. Do you? What do you do? Well, this is what I say. Now, try and remember when the last time was you had them. You know, where were you? What were you doing? When was the last time you knew the presence of Christ? If you're not a Christian, when was the last time you knew a prick in your conscience or in your heart about your need for Jesus and God? When was the last time you walked in the Spirit, Christian? Can you, can you retrace those steps just now? Can you detect and identify what happened? Some of you right away know. Some of you it needs a bit of time in the light of God's presence to actually find out what it was. There's a great story called Pilgrim's Progress. Some of you will have read it. Others may know of it. John Bunyan wrote it. It was a dream he had. It was an allegory, a picture story of the Christian life and Christians in it. And he's moving from the city of destruction. It's going to be destroyed by God's judgment to the celestial city of heaven. And he has a journey along the way. And he's just climbed the hill difficulty. And he meets two weird characters, mistrust, and timorous. Their names big phone sales, obviously. But along the way, he grew tired climbing the hill difficulty. That's not easy. It's not easy being a Christian. It's the best life, but it's not an easy life. And at one point, it says he stops in an arbor, which is a little cluster of trees under shade and tranquility, and he lay down and he rested. And he probably rested a wee bit too long. And a scroll, which was, if you like, his authentication to get into the celestial city, it fell out of his pocket. And he goes on his merry way after the rest, and he meets mistrust and timorous, and they start to question and test him in his faith and his journey to heaven. And in order to prove that he is the right and he is the promise that he's going to get there, he reaches into his pocket, and it's not there. His scroll's not there. And he panics. And this is what we read in the story. Listen to it. Then he went to look for his, his scroll, but all the way he went back. Who can sufficiently set forth the sorrow of Christian's heart? Sometimes he sighed, sometimes he wept, and oftentimes he chided himself for being so foolish to fall asleep in that place, which was erected only for a little refreshment from weariness. Thus, therefore, he went back carefully looking on this side and that, all the way he went back, if happily he might find his scroll that had been his comfort so many times in his journey. Listen, this is what he says. How many steps have I took in vain? And I am made to tread those steps with sorrow, which I might have trod with delight had it not been for this sinful sleep. How far might I have been on my way by this time? I am made to tread those steps thrice over, which I needed not to have trod but once. Yea, now also I am like to be benighted, for the day is almost spent. Oh, that I had not slept. That says it all, doesn't it? The old country Christian song went, Wasted years, wasted years. Oh, how foolish. I'm not wanting to labor any guilt or more of a worse feeling on you than you already have on top of you. But you know, godly sorrow leads to repentance. It does. 
and you realize you've gone so long and you had no need to without God in your life or without the presence of Christ in your heart and around you that you once knew and you do need to retrace those steps, where did you lose it? And maybe there's an issue that needs to be dealt with, an issue of repentance, an issue of deliverance, an issue of healing for hurts that's in your life. I don't know, but I would urge you tonight, take the hand of the Master, the nail-pierced hand of Jesus Christ. He's the Alpha and the Omega, you know that. He's not bound to time. And He will, and I've seen it happen time and time again, He will take you down the annals of your past, and He with you will visit that place and release you from that power, if you will let Him. Come sorrowfully and do it persistently. They lost him for a full day until they realized he was gone. I don't know how long it has been for you, but it says that they didn't give up looking for him for three whole days. And you can imagine, if you're a parent here tonight, imagine what would have been in your heart for three days and not find your child. But they persisted. We live in an instant age, don't we? And it's not conducive to waiting on God's presence or pressing through for God's blessing. But they persisted. And I would urge you here tonight, however far you feel you are from God or how long it is since you've known God's presence, I would challenge you tonight. Will you press in tonight? Will you persevere? Will you take God at His word? And you know where they found Jesus? Where did they find Him? They found him at the meeting place of God and man. You know that's called the temple in Jesus' day. That's the meeting place between God and man. Do you know where the meeting place between God and man today is? The place called Calvary. Where Jesus, the Savior of men, this same boy, grew to become the Lamb of God so that God would meet with you tonight and he took your sin and he took your shame and he took your pain and he took your heartache and he took your backsliding and he took your failures. He took it all because he loves you and because God wants you to know his presence forever. It's an awful thing to be devoid of the presence of God. And you know one of the things that hell is forever it is to be utterly separated. God owns hell. Don't think it's a place where God isn't. But you will not know the consciousness of the blessing of the presence of God forever. And those of us who have been here these nights know how awful that must be. Well, do you have his presence? Are you missing out in his presence? Have you lost his presence? Will you recover his presence? He's here. He's not way up there that you have to bring him down, but you can reach out and touch him. The words in your mouth now, the word of faith, if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved tonight because he's right beside you and he just wants to enter into your life right now. He's right here. He's right beside you. And if you just speak the word, he'll come in. Let us pray. Now, our meeting's almost over, and I would just ask for quietness in the presence of God. First of all, I want to address Christians. Christians who once knew a consciousness of God's presence, but something has happened. You don't know what it is, or maybe you do. Now listen, we're not necessarily addressing you as a backslider. You could be like I was way back in, was it January? You could be like I was. And you know something's wrong. You're numb. And you've been in these meetings and you're thinking, what is everybody going on about? I know there's something going on here, but I ain't getting it. Well, there's, there's a problem there if that's the case. Would you be able to confess that before God tonight? Maybe I could have the lights down, please, up above. 
Would you be able to confess that tonight, your need, by just raising your hand where you are? Now, Christians, we're talking to Christians. God bless you. God bless you. God will bless you for that. God will bless you for being honest. God bless you. Any other Christians? God bless you. Now, God bless. See, any of you in touch with God right now, would you please pray now while I'm making this appeal for those people? Any other Christians and you feel that sense of being forsaken and absence of the, the, the presence of God with you? I want to pray with these folk just now. Would you now pray to the Lord and say, Lord, search me. What is it What is the reason why I cannot sense your presence? Show me. Show me the sin that I need to repent of. Now, if it's there and he shows you, you better repent. <coughs> Show me what I need healed of, deep in my spirit. Show me what I need delivered of, where the enemy has gotten a grip upon me. Would you pray that? Show me the sin I need to repent of. Show the wound that I need healed of. Show any demonic empowerment that I need to be released from. And Lord, may tonight you witness with me as I obey you and whatever you show me tonight or whenever, may you witness to me your presence. Now, I want to now address anybody who has known his presence and you've lost it. And you know you've lost it. You're not like the people we've just mentioned. You know when and where and how. You might be called a backslider. We'll, we'll not worry about that. But you know this applies to you. Would you raise your hand and say, I need the Lord's presence back. I need to confess sin I do. Just keep your hand up long enough for me to see it. Is there anyone? You know that you're in a backslidden state and that's why you haven't got God's presence. Is there anyone? Just leave it for a moment. Is there anyone? And you once walked with God, you once knew the fullness of the Spirit, you once were aware of that abiding presence with you, but you have sinned or someone's hurt you or you've given way to the enemy and opened a doorway of danger and he's got a hold on you. God bless you. Anybody else? God is moving in people's hearts. Don't miss this opportunity. Scripture warns. Call upon the Lord while he is near. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Call upon him while he's near, and he's near. Would you call tonight? Is anybody else? Backstead, God bless you. Anybody else? If I've missed your hand, put it up again. Now, let me pray with you now. You confess your sin, whatever you know it is, you confess it now, okay? Or if it's a hurt someone did to you, you need to forgive them, and you need to declare forgiveness to them now in Jesus' name. All right? doesn't matter whether you're right and they're wrong. That's not the issue. The issue is it's blocking fellowship with God. That's the issue. It's not them or you. It's the issue of enjoying God. You can't do it. You do not forgive your brother or sister their sin. Your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Black and white in the Bible. So you just come, confess your sin, ask him to heal your wound, having forgiven that person or persons, and command the enemy to go from you in Jesus' name, confessing whatever area you've opened up to him. And just confess your sins to him. Come to the cross again. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Plead the blood. And thank him for hearing you. Thank him for hearing you. Is there anyone here tonight, finally, who has never been converted, who's not born again, who's not saved, cleansed, and forgiven of their sins, and you've never known the true presence of God in your life, and you still have that aching void that spells God in your heart? and you want to be right with God tonight, and you want to know his presence. That entails repenting of sin, turning from it, and turning to Jesus. He'll give you the power to overcome it, and believing that he alone is able to save you. 
Is there anyone, raise your hand tonight, who wants to come to Christ and be saved? Where you are, are there any? Just raise your hand, young or old, doesn't matter. Are there any? Before I close the service tonight, are there any? Raise your hand high enough so as I can see it. Someone who has never trusted Christ before, never known the presence of Christ, are there any? Now, if you haven't indicated tonight that that's your need, but you want to come to the Lord, pray this. Pray this from your heart. Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I confess I am a sinner, and I repent of my sins and believe that Jesus died for me. I ask you to save me because of Jesus. Forgive me and cleanse me. I make you Lord of my life. I renounce Satan and all his works. And I ask you now to fill and possess me by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to help you tonight. If you want to come to Christ and you haven't already, or if you've got issues that you want to talk over, you don't need really to talk to us, but we're here to help. You deal with God, but we can help you, we can. And we will. God bless you. And may you all continue to know and enjoy the presence of Almighty God. God bless you.